houses, and I would like to welcome you to Microbes After Hours. Um, we are so pleased that you've decided to spend some time with us here at the American Society for Microbiology. Um, as you know, the ASM is the oldest and largest life science organization, and we, this particular program is an ongoing program so we can bring the scientists directly to you here in this audience and to our online community. So welcome to those of you who are also online as well. The Academy is the honorific leadership group of ASM and what we do is we try to recognize scientists for their outstanding contributions to the field of microbiology and also to use our scientists, to use our fellows to help better address the complex issues of science that we face as a public. So today's topic, as you all know, is the water supply. And I am so thrilled to be able to be here with two, two very great speakers. And the way that we're going to proceed is that I'm going to introduce each speaker. They will come up, they will present for about 15 minutes, and then go sit down. And at the end of both of the presentations, we're going to entertain questions both from you here in the room as well as online. For those of you who are currently online and want to start sending in the questions as you hear the presentation, I'd invite you to do so. And please use hashtag after hours um, to be able to supply your questions. And also, just so you know that this particular presentation is going to be archived forevermore on microbeworld.org or YouTube um, on Microbe World. For those of you in the audience that would like to have questions at the Q&A period, you are invited to come to the mic and we will kind of take it from there. So, um, our first speaker, because we are going to do a dual kind of perspective here, both the national perspective as well as the international perspective dealing with the water supply, is Dr. Sudhir Murthy, and he is from DC Water. Um, he's the innovations chief for, this, for DC Water and he works very closely with the general manager, and um, he leads the development, the implementation, and the continuous improvement of the authority's innovation strategy, which is clearly a very comp important component of how we address the threats that we face, both in the water supply and how to meet the needs of the growing public. Um, I was particularly interested in hearing how he leads that transition from the research world into more the practical world. Um, Dr. Murthy has a PhD in civil engineering from Virginia Tech, and I'm very pleased to say that he has many, many accolades, and we are so glad that he is able to join us here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. You know, in, in the water utility uh, world, we have actually two products. Uh, we have a drinking water product, and we have a clean water product. And what we, when, when we call, say a clean water product, we treat wastewater and actually produce clean water that we uh, can reuse or put into rivers and actually serve our ecosystems. And, and so, so we have these two products. And it's interesting that in the context of microorganisms, in the drinking water product world, microbes are usually the bad guys and we try to destroy them or kill them. On, on, the, on the clean water side, they are the good guys. And in, in fact, uh, if you add up all of the utilities uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the United States or North America, we are probably the largest industrial size users of microorganisms. And so, so, so we, we use microorganisms on the clean water side and we try to destroy them on the drinking water side. And so that's a, a kind of a story that I'd like to tell you. So DC Water serves Washington, D.C. Uh, for, for, for drinking water, but we also serve Montgomery County and Prince George's County and Fairfax County, parts of them, and Loudoun County uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the clean water side, the wastewater side, and so uh, the clean water product side. And so, so we, we have a dual role where we, we supply drinking water to D.C. And, 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 and clean water to D.C. And, and the suburbs. And we... Uh, uh, on, the, on the drinking water side, uh, what we do is we, 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 we try to destroy pathogens on uh, microorganisms by, by really using a multiple barrier approach. 
And so, so what we do is uh, we try to do a prevention approach first, and that's uh, using source water protection. And then we go into water treatment itself. So uh, many of you may have been to a water treatment plant, and what we do there is we first try to remove particles and turbidity associated with water where, where the microorganisms could actually reside on, on these particles. And then we, we try to remove them first before we actually add a disinfectant, such as chlorine or chloramine and so on. And so, so we, we, we use these multiple barriers where we first try to protect the water itself uh, from, from contamination. Then we try to treat it with, uh, with multiple approaches. And then we try and keep a residue uh, of, of disinfectant in the in the distribution system, and 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 that that protects the water as it goes through the distribution system. So it's it's those different approaches. And in the context of source water protection, uh, the the water uh, for Washington D.C. comes from the Potomac River, and you know we 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 get the water uh, from the Potomac River and we put it back into the Potomac River uh, to protect the ecosystem. And so it's, it's this dual role that we play. And, and, and we, we try to work with other utilities in the region to protect that watershed in the Potomac River using the Interstate Commission of the Potomac River Basin. Shifting tracks to the wastewater side. We, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the, the photo you have uh, out here is, the, uh, is of the Blue Plains Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant. It actually happens to be one of the largest uh, advanced treatment facilities in the world. And it happens to be right in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the reason why it's called advanced is uh, we, we remove uh, organic material uh, so that it doesn't kill the fish. We remove nitrogen uh, to prevent it from uh, to prevent the eutrophication in the Chesapeake Bay, and we remove phosphorus uh, to prevent uh, uh, eutrophication in the Potomac River. And so it's this uh, this this role that we play where we try to protect the water bodies. And and it, it so happens that increasingly at all over the world, there's such a great deal of intensification occurring, intensification, urbanization. Large large groups of people are moving to urban centers. And, 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 and Blue Plains and, and this, the, these kinds of uh, treatment plants uh, serve as some examples of how, how things can be done. And what's happening uh, in, in the context of wastewater treatment is, is something uh, really, uh, re really new and transformative. Uh, in, in the past, uh, when, we, when we start looking at microorganisms, we, we always look, look them, looked at them as black boxes. Uh, you know, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd put, uh, uh, put our wastewater into these uh, huge reactors. We really didn't know exactly what was happening, but, but we wanted our outcomes, you know, whether it was a removal of nitrogen, uh, removal of phosphorus, or removal of carbon uh, by, by these mi microorganisms. But, but what's happening with, with, the, with the convergence of uh, biotechnology, uh, where we can actually understand what's, uh, what, what these organisms are doing, and, and, and actually, actually by sensing, we're using sensors uh, to look at reactants and products, uh, the entire field is changing. And um, we can now start seeing huge intensification of our processes uh, associated with treatment. Uh, we are able to do things in half the volume, a quarter of the volume, with, with much less energy uh, than, than, than was needed in the past. And so this, this whole convergence of biotechnology and, and the sensing of chemicals has, has changed how we do things. It's almost uh, like, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's uh, dramatic, it's, it's coming from going from a hunter-gatherer society to civilization where agriculture changed things, where you knew what was rice and what was wheat, and, and you knew how to control the growth of rice and wheat, and that's, that's how transformative things are happening in, in the whole world of industrial scale or, or wastewater treatment to produce clean, clean water. I'll give you an example. Um, in 1996, uh, uh, around, uh, around then, uh, there was a discovery of a novel uh, group of microorganisms called Anamox. And in, in, in general, uh, how we do uh, uh, nitrogen removal in a wastewater treatment plant is take ammonia and we convert ammonia and we actually use a lot of energy in, in terms of oxygen. We supply huge amounts of oxygen to remove energy. Ammonia has got energy in it. And so we use energy to remove energy and, and we convert it to nitrate. And then we use more energy in terms of uh, uh, carbon 
to convert nitrate to nitrogen gas. And so, it's, so we, we use energy to remove energy, and then we use more energy to remove that uh, nitrate to nitrogen gas. And so it, it, it may sound ridiculous, but that's how uh, it, it has been done for maybe 25, 30 years. Uh, with, the, with the discovery of Animox and the ability to control this organism, precisely control the organism, precisely control the, the, the conditions for the growth of this organism, we can now use anaerobic processes, anaerobic ammonium oxidation, where we can uh, use the energy in ammonia to, to actually grow these organisms, because ammonia has energy, and we grow the organisms using uh, uh, the energy from ammonia and, and convert it straight to nitrogen gas. And so, but, but, the, but the problem there is, how do you actually play the game of just selecting for the right organisms uh, un unlike a uh, pharmaceutical plant, we don't have any control of our, uh, of, of our feedstock. Our feedstock is variable in quality and variable in quantity. And so how do you actually control that feedstock quality and quantity to actually grow the right organism? We want to grow that exact right, or correct organism and, and, and make it all happen in, in, that, in that tank. And you can do that now because of all of the biotechnology tools we have and the uh, and the information technology tools, you bring them together and, it, and make things happen. And so this is being replicated in almost every process in a wastewater treatment plant, where, where we're bringing these things together to make things happen, using less energy and, and doing it in half the volume, maybe quarter of the volume. And that's, that's the exciting side of the microbiology uh, of, of, of clean water. Uh, while, while we, there's also this really exciting side in, in, in actually killing organisms in drinking water. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I, I, I could go on to Kellogg. Okay, yeah? sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our second speaker now is Dr. Kellogg Schwab. Dr. Schwab is actually a professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he's also the director of uh, Hopkins Water Institute and the Center for Water and Health. And he addresses many of the same types of issues that were just sort of described. Um, his research focuses on environmental microbiology and engineering with an emphasis on the fate and transport of microorganisms in water, food, and the environment and sustainability, a topic very near and dear to my heart. And uh, Dr. Schwab received his PhD from the University of North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. And uh, what I'm going to do is actually communicate about some of the international aspects of water and the challenges facing it. But I'm going to start broadly. And what I'd like to do is actually start with this idea that Water is actually across many different disciplines. And the example I'm going to use is that in 2007, the British Medical Journal put a poll out to say what was the most greatest medical breakthrough since 1840. And this poll was internal. They asked uh, uh, leading professionals and they did a survey. And the idea is what possibly could be the most important medical breakthrough. And the ideas that could come across would be vaccines, anesthesia, but what one was sanitation. Clean water and sewage disposal was the most important medical breakthrough in there. So the connections to microbes and the idea of protection of health really crosses many different disciplines. But what's the challenge that we face now across the world? And we know that climate change is occurring and that the floods and droughts are going to be of challenge. And there's going to be challenges that are going to face many different disciplines. And it's not just the amount, the total precipitation, it's how it's going to be distributed across the world. And the onset of snow melt could change and these other approaches. This is going to increase the severity of floods and droughts. And the loss of reliability of existing water supply reservoirs is going to be critically important. And it's not just internationally, but it's also domestically as well, as we reduce the supply of water in there. What's also important to realize that water rights are vigorously defended by the privileged users. And agriculture and manufacturing use the greatest share of the world's water. And agriculture actually uses 70% of water withdrawals around the world. Water scarcity is also has an economic issue. The value of water, the economic value of water and all its competing uses 
should be recognized as an economic good. Now there's a question about water being an inalienable right, but I draw your attention to providing clean water, providing potable water to the population is requiring a debate to go on that should users pay for these costs to ensure accountability and financial sustainability. I would ask you here and to the others that are listening to this, have you ever washed a rental car? No one actually answers yes to this question unless they might charge you if you brought it back dirty. Sense of ownership and value are important. When you have something that sweat equity, you own something, you take care of it. The same with water. If we do not value water and all its competing goods, sometimes we don't take care of it and all its aspects in there. So what are some of the water issues that are facing uh, the world and also the United States? Well, potable water, drinking water, and sanitation are intimately linked. If you don't have adequate sanitation, it's very challenging to have high quality water be provided. Agricultural industry and municipalities compete for a finite resource. And the global needs for water resources and infrastructure exceed capacity. There is an advantage that we have now, and it's called leapfrogging, leapfrogging technology the use of decentralized infrastructure with real-time telemetry. We call that the cell phone effect. Instead of maybe building massive amounts of pipes in areas of the world where they couldn't afford that infrastructure, we dis decentralize it. We make water and wastewater treatment at the local level, at a household level or community level, even within a building within a city, to have this idea of really addressing the approaches that can meet the needs of the people in that local region. What's incredibly important is that you must understand that human behavior and even business models have to be integrated in this for success to be achieved. That if you don't figure out what people want, a push versus pull, you really are gonna have a hard time having something be sustainable and scalable. So what are the challenges in the international setting? Well, over 850 million people lack access to improved water. Now improved does not necessarily mean safe. It means you have a tap within a certain distance from your home. And over 2.4 billion people lack access to improved sanitation. 40% of the world's population does not have a place to go to the bathroom that's considered to be an improved place. The coverage for these both improved water supply and sanitation lags behind in the poorest communities, those rural and peri-urban environments. What we know is that over 1.5 million children die from diarrheal diseases each year. And every 15 seconds, a child is dying from a diarrheal disease. This is greater than AIDS, malaria, and measles combined. Estimated more than half of the hospital patients suffer from water-related diseases. Improved water access and sanitation can dramatically decrease this burden. We know we have the capacity to do this, but how do you implement it? How do you figure out the human behavior side of things in there? So what are some of the basic requirements that are estimated? For the minimum standard to meet the four basic needs is about 50 liters per person per day for drinking, sanitation, bathing, and cooking. And I'm going to tell you a startling fact about water. It's heavy. And in Africa, women and children spend 40 billion person hours a year hauling water. This woman is carrying 30 liters on her head. 30 liters, 30 kilograms, 66 pounds. She's walking about two and a half kilometers each way. This young child has a permanently deformed neck. She's about 30 kilograms in weight and she's carrying 20 kilograms, two thirds of her body mass. This young child, this, this young girl is not going to school and it's not because she's carrying water. It's because she doesn't have an adequate place to have sanitation at her school. And when she gets older, there's no place for her to have ministries. This is the challenge we face. To empower these young girls, put sanitation in place and to have that be a driver will be one of the ways we drive change. So what is the impact of gastroenteritis? At any one time, about 200 million people on Earth have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And the volume of diarrhea fluid discharged in the environment each day equals the volume of water flowing over Victoria Falls every two minutes. 200,000 cubic meters of fluid are impacting our environment each and every day. A great dinnertime conversation for whenever you're viewing this later. If we do some math, an ill individual excretes about a billion microorganisms per gram or milliliter of feces. If you do the equation there and you have one milliliter times a liter, which is 10 to the, another 10 to the third, times another for cubic meter, so it's another 10 to the third, you end up with 200 quintillion microbes per day impacting our environment. Please remember to wash your hands. 
The other thing to do is we'd want to treat this. And so what might be the microorganisms that we present in this contaminated waste? Well, in microbial pollution, there are many different bacteria. There are cholera, typhoid, and dysentery. These are words and names of microorganisms that affect the world. In the United States, we've actually attributed most of our high quality drinking water that we've reduced this. We do not worry about typhoid or cholera when we're brushing our teeth. We do are concerned about E. coli and Campylobacter and Salmonella to some extent. But a lot of the literature focuses on the bacteria. There are other microorganisms that might be present there as well, including the viruses. My area of research personally has been focusing on norovirus. Norovirus, which is known as the cruise ship virus as well, is very small and very tough. There's actually about 23 million cases of norovirus per year in the United States, an order of magnitude higher than all the bacteria contaminants that are present as well, which are in the millions. But it's not just viruses. There's also protozoa. And the protozoa include Giardia, which is worldwide, and Cryptosporidium. And in the water industry, 21 years ago in Milwaukee, half the city got sick from Cryptosporidium. It is a parasite that does not react with chlorine. The chlorine will not disinfect Cryptosporidium. Why did half the city get sick? Well, one treatment plant had some deficiencies, the other did not. They've been trying to correct that. This is an eye-opening experience to realize the United States were not safe or free from these microbial contaminants as well. It's not a us and them, it is a we issue. What is the size of these microorganisms? And this is important because if you're treating water, there are two things to remember about microorganisms. One is the size. This is a cartoon of a red blood cell, about seven microns. A cryptosporidium, a protozoa, is three microns in size. E. coli, a common bacteria that we've heard of, about 0.2 to, to uh, 5 microns, and 0.5 to 2 microns in size. And finally, in the bottom corner, are the noroviruses. They're 0.03 microns in size, 30 nanometers, orders of magnitude different. If you are going to treat water internationally or even domestically and use filtration, the smaller microorganisms might slip through if you don't have careful processes. The joy and the excitement we have in the United States is we have a multi-barrier approach to things, but some places that's not the case where they use one treatment mechanism. So the idea of remembering that there's other groups of microorganisms out there is critically important. Not only the size, the other thing is the persistence of these microorganisms. The protozoa can persist for many, many weeks to months in the environment and remain infectious. The enteric viruses, such as norovirus and rotavirus, can persist for weeks to a few months and remain infectious. Both of these groups are much more resistant to environmental degradation than the vegetative bacteria, the E. coli and the salmonella. It doesn't mean those bacteria are not a problem, but they don't persist as long. They also are a difference in how they react with the most commonly used disinfectant, chlorine. As I mentioned, cryptosporidium does not react with chlorine but the vegetative bacteria can be degraded if appropriate dose and contact time are used. So what's going on with respect to a household in international settings that can drive challenges? Well, one of the things is that you might have contamination at the source water. And this can be from increasing populations, increasing urban growth, pollutant transport, deforestation. So if your source water is contaminated, it's very challenging to then have high quality water at the house. Some communities actually have higher quality source water, or they do treat the water. But when that water leaves a treatment plant, it goes through an infrastructure system that is at the best compromised. Because water takes an incredible amount of energy to be moved around. And when energy is in limited supply, sometimes the pipes are shut down, meaning there's no pressure in the pipes, and microorganisms can intrude into those pipes, causing contamination. And I ask you today, did you fill your bathtub up this morning with the expectation there would be no water tonight? In the United States, we don't even think about this availability of water from the unsung heroes that are working hard to provide this high quality water every day. But in many areas of the world, you fill up whatever vessel is possible whenever the water comes out. And in many countries, that might be intermittent at best. And if you fill that water container, with the water. So you have clean water coming in, you have a pipe system that may or may not be good. The storage of that water at the household results in contamination. So the domestic use of water that is stored has a very hard time remaining clean. In the United States, one of the sweetest smells I smell is the smell of a disinfectant in my water when I'm drinking it because I know something's in there. 
It's working, it's doing its job. But in international settings, open storage containers are a problem. I was offered water from this container here. And I, to refuse water from an individual is a challenge. I knew if I drank that water, I'd be in trouble. So I had to think up something because the human needs and behavior are important. And I said, I'm already ill. It would pass through me. It's no value there. Uh, a little bit of a challenge in there, but that's part of what we deal with is we learn to respect each other. And there's some challenges in there. Other ones is that the children in many areas of the world do not adequately wash their hands. And the touching of this water with fecally contaminated hands can instantly contaminate and recontaminate large volumes of water. So that's a challenge. And the storage container itself can be perpetually contaminated, causing this issue to be there. So vector contamination is an issue with flies transmitting things, and then inadequate cleaning of the vessels and the biofilms in there. So what technology would be appropriate in international settings to remove those groups of microorganisms? You can have a simple clay pot that can be used. The Potters for Peace designed this, that you can actually have organic material and clay and you combust it and it leaves a tortuous pass, path through that clay pot that you'd filter the water. It can remove bacteria, but viruses slip right through. If the pot, grip, pot breaks, it filters water very quickly. And that's thought to be a good thing, except for if you understand it defeats the purpose of having the filtration, so communication is a problem. You can have a technology as advanced membrane treatment. But if no one's there to repair it or have a supply chain in the last mile, it can clog and foul, and in a few days it would not be of use, or a few weeks, if you don't have appropriate chains. You can have treatment of water at the small level, say 10 liters for 10 cents, or you can go to the entire village and treat the, the, the village level water in a for-profit system. I don't have the answer to this, but one of the things we're working on Hopkins and others in the microbiology group has to be that we educate the challenges facing that it's not simple. It's one of these basic things that you would think would be fundamentally easy to do. It's incredibly complex because we have to engage in the human behavior and an understanding of the dynamics before we, we uh, approach these questions. So what can we summarize? Well, water is a finite and precious resource. You know, give it some thought when you're brushing your teeth. In high income countries, I bet you weren't thinking that you might die of cholera in two days when you were brushing your teeth this morning. But it's something to remember that the unsung heroes that are providing that high quality water are working every day to make sure that's there. And we can translate this information to other places around the world. Fresh water is not distributed uniformly across the earth. This makes it challenging. And many countries are facing water stress or water scarcity resulting in political conflict and economic hardship as is the United States. If you were living in California, if you live in Texas, if you live in Florida, if you live in the DC region, we have complex challenges to our water here in the United States as well. So it's not a them problem, it is a we issue. And we have the knowledge and the technology right now to treat water anywhere in the world. The challenge is the human behavior, the supply chains, the distribution, the willingness to value these things that we basically take for granted and have disconnected in the U.S. Appropriate selection must include an understanding of human behavior and economic capacity. So what can you do? Well, the single most important thing we can do is what your mother told you. Wash your hands. So we get that out of the way. That's how I have to say that every time, is washing your hands is incredibly important. You can conserve water. Each one of us should treat this and respect it. We have ideas about water reuse. We have ideas that we're taking branding of water and talking clean water. It is a word that you never heard that was about the waste side of things. It is a branding of saying this is a reinvigoration of water that we used once and will use again. So how we describe our water is as important sometimes as the methods we use to treat it. Watershed protection. It's self-evident. Clean water in clean water out. If we protect our watershed sources, we have a better ability to have higher quality water for all its uses. And finally, we all need to know and let our legislators know that indoor plumbing is important, tap and toilet, and infrastructure maintenance and replacement should be a priority. The value of water, I would ask you to go home and look at your bills. I want you to look at your water bill, your cable bill, and your phone bill. And you make the decision how long you could last with those three things for what period of time and what value we put in with that. 
And that's the way the connection to microbiology and engineering and human behavior and public health really drive things together and to drive change. Thank you for your time. So now I would like to invite both of our speakers up and we would like to entertain questions both from the audience as well as from online. I know Erica Shugart, our Director of Communications, is, is going to be collecting those questions. So, any questions? Start. Please go up. Thank you. Uh, for Dr. Murthy, um, are Animox oh, bacteria I'm sorry, I'm gonna in... Just, I'm, oh, I'm just going to interrupt yep. my mistake. Please say your name oh. and the organization that you're with. Uh, Wes McDermott, uh, freelance. Um, I was wondering if Animox bacteria are used in production anywhere yet, or is that something that's in development? Oh, oh it's, it's, it's full scale. Uh, uh -huh. in, 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 uh, in the U.S., there are several uh, plants uh, that are in design and uh, several plants that are in operation. In, in Europe, there are maybe, maybe uh, as many as 50 uh, uh, operating plants uh, using them. Thank you. My name is Carl Custer, FSIS retired, and so I'm a food microbiologist, and I'm really concerned about sources, source waters here in the U.S., and particularly runoff from uh, food animal grow-out facilities. For example, in the November Applied and Environmental Mi Microbiology, Michelle Di uh, Danuk's uh, group had a nice little paper on surface uh, salmonella in surface waters in Florida. And well, they may have come from reptiles, but I'm betting a lot of it could have come from animal grow out facilities. Randy Warbo out of uh, uh, Cornell uh, earlier this year had a paper on Listeria and Salmonella in waters. And I asked him, I said, Randy, so where were the dairy farms? He said, upstream. So that's a big issue, it, both for irrigation water and then also this aerosols and feral uh, animals carrying it to produce orchards and, of course, waterways. Any comments? You know, if you, if you look at the Potomac watershed, uh, the, uh, the upstream reaches of the Potomac, almost uh, all of the farms, uh, nearly all of the farms use manure. Uh, they, 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 there's such an abundance of manure available uh, in the Potomac watershed that that's, that's, that's the main source of uh, nitrogen uh, and phosphorus for, for agriculture. And, and, and if you look at that, uh, um, the potential of contamination, uh, say from um, microorganisms, and, 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 and not only microorganisms, there's uh, contamination from nitrogen and phosphorus from the from manure, as well as, uh, you know, now, now the big thing is intersex fish. Uh, so the, the hormones that come, come from the manure. Uh, and so, so really the key aspect uh, is, is really to protect and, and create buffer strips and, and, and protect the river from 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 uh, agriculture practice that that is not 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 uh, not the best standards, and that's that's really the effort that we've really uh, taken uh, to heart is is trying to protect the watershed. Uh, source water protection becomes important because once you do that, you actually help a whole bunch of different things. Just not the bacteria. You 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 help with protection of uh, of the water from from a different 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 approaches and, and really the ecosystem in the end, the fish and so on. I'm going to switch hats because mm -hmm. I do a lot of uh, domestic work as well and actually um, I've worked for over uh, 15 years on concentrated animal feeding operations and the fate and transport of contaminants. And there's every, in, in this room, every one of us should be concerned about the sub-therapeutic use of antibiotics that are going in large animal production. And we've done studies, we've provided peer review uh, publications that when you have concentrated animals with excessive amounts of waste, they are, uh, these, these microorganisms in that waste can have uh, antibiotic resistant. And we've shown that in the waterways, and others have as well, and we've also shown in the air for airborne transmission. And we've gone further, and my colleagues gone further and looked in the food supply itself and found antibiotic resistant in the food supply in there, the true connections. The linking of it has been the challenge. And so we're doing some genomic analysis on the specific genes that are present in these antibiotic resistant bacteria to link them to the source because that's part of this ch uh, challenge is where is it coming from. The evidence base is overwhelming. 
that we have a crisis in our hands with antibiotic resistant bacteria. And each one of us needs to be addressed and aware of where we get our food and how it's supplied. Now if I was to shift hats back to international, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is that the western style food production is now across the world. In Brazil, they are cutting down the rainforest to provide soybeans that are then shipped to China for pig production, and now China is one of the leading consumers of swine using the same practices with even limited regulations in there. And the antibiotic resistance that are running in those swine facilities is also a problem. So yes, you're, you're right on the money, not only watershed protection and the, and the challenge we face, but also translating into our food supply. I have a question actually to kind of change gears a little bit. It has to do with the pipes. And I'd like to ask you about the microbial ecology of those pipes and what effect that has on the water that goes through the pipes and then is delivered to us through the tap. And any efforts underway how to kind of monitor and model the different yeah. ecologies of water. So, uh, you know, within the context of uh, the, the issues of today, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, one, one, one concern uh, is, uh, is how, how do you maintain the pipes uh, and, 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 and maintain a favorable ecology uh, in the pipes. And, 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 and because even though we add chlorine, there's always uh, some, some amount of uh, microorganisms, healthy microorganisms present in the pipes. Um, the adverse effects could be, say for example, uh, we, we, we've uh, changed from chlorine to chloramine and changing from chlorine to chloramine results in nitrification in the pipe because uh, chloramine contains ammonia and, and that results in nitrification. And so uh, uh, most water utilities today that have switched from chlorine to chloramine actually start uh, struggling now with, uh, with the whole unintended con consequence of nitrification. And so, so what we now need to do is really minimize the age of water in the pipe. And so we, we try to keep the water uh, uh, in the pipe, moving along, uh, prevent dead ends from forming, and actually uh, reduce the water age in the pipe, so that you have less nitrification. And if you have less nitrification, you have less corrosion, because my nitrification actually also uh, leads to corrosion of pipes. And so, so there's uh, there's all of this. Uh, uh, you know, you you, you start off uh, changing say from chlorine to chloramine, and then you have uh, a cascade of effects occurring, such as nitrification and corrosion and so on. And so. So from a, from a pipe's perspective, it's, it's a very interesting uh, but also a challenging chemistry associated with how you manage the pipes, how you manage the biofilms, the pri pipes, as well as how do you secure the pipes from corrosion perspective so that you don't have contamination and leakage in the pipes as a result of corrosion. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges that we're facing in, in the, the Hopkins uh, Water Institute is working on is, is preparedness and resiliency. And part of that is in disaster response. And the examples I'm going to use, one of them is, is one at Hurricane Katrina. And I was involved in that response, but one of the things that came out of that is the city's population decreased for a period of time, which meant that the flow of the water also was affected in there, and they were having challenges of moving water appropriately through those pipes when there was less demand for it which is a, a considerable challenge. Detroit is also facing this right now with a population that's decreasing and you have a few households at the end of a line, what do you do for those communities? Do you maintain that high quality water flushing at an extreme cost or do you shift it? And this is part of the, the, the challenges that are facing those, those communities. In addition to the distribution systems, what's a very interesting part of this is the biofilms that you alluded to that are coming from the pipes in the water utilities, but what happens when they get into the building? And so within buildings, there's also biofilms that are growing. And some of these biofilms can actually harbor microorganisms that are of concern, such as Legionella. And Legionella is a bacteria that can be affecting people that are in, say, immunocompromised, such as what you might find in a hospital and other ones too. So the challenge is how do you maintain that water from the source all the way to the sip? source to sip with the dynamics of going on there that the value of water we talked about might not be able to provide enough resources to have the highest quality that we'd like come through there. And how do you prioritize this? And how do buildings address this? If they add disinfectants or something to their water supply, they are now potentially considered a water utility. 
So then you have regulation issues on that as well. And so there's always this constant battle of, of what we do with the goal of trying to improve public health. And pipes and biofilms are an incredibly important part of this aspect. Very good. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Neal, a curious citizen. And you would mentioned uh, one thing is a lot of our water flushes out of our houses and goes to our waste treatment plants for through our toilets. So do you see technology in the horizon that would eliminate that use of water? So, so the question is, uh, uh, will we in the future not need to flush the water or, uh, or, or reuse that water uh, perhaps? Um, both actually. Yeah. But first it was no longer have the need to begin with, but yeah. intermediate step is yeah. So, you know, uh, th there's always the concept of dry and composting toilets, uh, and, and, and that's, that's a c uh, concept that's actually very prevalent and, 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 uh, and doing quite well in, 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 in some parts of the world. Uh, in the context of uh, um, uh, United States, uh, there are a couple of approaches. One is uh, you could use different, different types of water for flushing. You don't have to use portable water for flushing. For example, uh, you could use uh, non-portable water for flushing, and so uh, so even though you may have a water system in your house, you could use non-portable water. In Hong Kong, for example, they use seawater for flushing, and uh, and so that's 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 the practice in Hong Kong, and they've been using seawater for flushing for quite some time, and they're somewhat surprised when uh, when people uh, are uh, are shocked that okay, you're using seawater for flushing. How do you do that? And you know, it's, uh, it's something that they've been doing. So, so there are different approaches to use uh, 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 non-portable water for flushing. If you were to use portable water for flushing, what do you do? And how do you actually reuse and recover the water? That's really where we are going in, uh, in what I would call it the next generation of treatment. How do you maximize the conservation first, then the reuse of that water in, in a manner that, that actually supports uh, supports uh, um, the, the ecosystem, but also uh, uh, the, the public at large in, in, urban, in highly urbanized areas. And this is really a big issue in the west coast of the United States, especially the southwest, where there's this huge droughts. And uh, now they are faced with the whole question of how do you actually optimize your use of your water uh, within, the, within those uh, urban centers. So. In the 1960s, there was a movie called The Graduate where Dustin Hoffman was shaking hands with an individual and the man said, plastics. And if you had invested in plastics in the 60s, you'd probably be a wealthy individual. I would, if I was going to shake your hands, and actually we'd probably do something like this because of the <laughs> microphone, I would say reuse. Because one of the things we have to consider is how are we going to use water for the appropriate needs in there? We call it designer water. Appropriate use of water for the appropriate needs. Do you need the highest quality potable water to flush your toilet? Of course not. But the system was set up that prevented us from having these dual use systems in each of our homes and buildings. I would attest that legislation going forward should say that every new building should have in place the ability to adapt. And to be that living building, a part of it would be water that's for drinking water is a smaller pipe where you have less problems with it, it's easier to control. Larger volumes would be gray water that could be used for uh, uh, laundries or, or other types of washing. Larger, even higher volume for fighting fires. That could be even uh, a different type of water quality in there, but all the appropriate needs in there. And you could make this in a cost-effective way. So decentralizing and then having appropriate use of water. And by the way, microbes are going to be critical to this. If you look at some of the membrane bioreactors that are coming online to use the water appropriately, we're using microorganisms to generate the energy that you alluded to at the scale, which is great that uh, DC is very progressive in saying we're going to actually tap into microbiology to, to conserve energy and to, to save money. You can do that at the local level in a decentralized way too. And there's entrepreneurship in there. There's ways to, to develop systems that can that push that very forward. Good. How are we, though, with the social science part of that, the behavioral science part, when you go out and you talk to the public about these kind of initiatives? How, how is that received? Do you know how much your water bill is? People don't know. There's a disconnect. 
there's a disconnect in water, and I'm not being facetious about that. I'm talking about this idea of how do you change human behavior is one of the most incredible, complex things. Yeah. What we're learning from our engineering colleagues and, and those that are working on water and water issues is that the human behavior side of it is sometimes more critical to get right from the beginning. Now, there's programs that have been put in place if we think about threats. One of the threats is, you know, HIV AIDS. And because it became a, such a threat, people became aware and they became adapted to change. And there's other studies that have done this in international settings with, with bed nets and malaria and things. But in the water and sanitation, there's been a little bit of a disconnect on how do you get people to change behavior. And in the United States, if your water bill was the most expensive part of that phone cable issue, you might think twice before you were washing the car for the third time without letting the rain be part of that washing process or something. So there's ways we can drive it through tariffs and there's innovative ways to try this, but there has to be a willingness of the population. We are at a tipping point. In my mind, we are at a tipping point in the United States and high income countries that if we carry on with this ability of having large volumes of water without the value that can be a return to the utilities for them to be progressive in conservation, we are going to have a hard time maintaining that high quality in the next 20 years and flushing our toilets and getting that potable water. The unsung heroes, as I alluded to, is that treatment of water is incredibly complex. In a multi-barrier system, if you don't get it right, when the rain changes that turbidity level coming in the raw water source, things can happen that are bad. So every day of the year, there are engineers and she's working hard to really make sure that the appropriate parameters are addressed. We've disconnected on that. And we need to reconnect and have a value and a branding and a marketing stream on there. Well put, Carol. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's something that we've discussed. Uh, and, 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 and you're exactly right. The engineers are there. And they're, they're doing a good job. And, and, and in, in, in the context of water utilities, we've, re we've grown to rely on engineers. Uh, in, the f in, in, in the future, we do also need to rely on the whole aspect of uh, communicating that value of water. Because uh, as long as we don't communicate to the public the value of water, they do not see it. And, and, and there are all of these bottled water companies that are out there communi communicating a perceived value of water in, the, in, those, uh, in those bottles that, uh, that are out there. And we are not doing that job. And so we have to do a much better job of being the marketing uh, companies associated with drinking water and, and also the clean water that we, we produce mm -hmm. in, as a product. And so, so, so the next generation of water utilities will need really a large social science component in their uh, in their portfolio of people that they have. So, bottled water has its place, you know, especially in responses and things like that. But how many showers have you taken with bottled water? And if you have, how short have those showers been? Because of the value of that water that's in there is expensive, and you would use it for what purpose it needs. But what we need to do is figure out solutions to saying this is a value across different disciplines and across the approaches there. And there's a lot of marketing that's been developed that we as engineers and public health practitioners haven't quite caught on to yet, but there's ways that we could move this forward mm -hmm. in innovative ways. Mm -hmm. Great. Hi, oh. uh, Craig Moran, no affiliation. <laughs> I want to know, are there safety issues associated with groundwater, say from a well? And if not, why aren't wells used more often? Wells, wells are actually used uh, in, in uh, they're large groundwater wells that are used in big, in urban areas. In DC, we, we, we do use the Potomac River water, but, but groundwater is used. The problem is that uh, if, if, if you have a groundwater well as, as, a, as a local resident of, of your own, you need to make sure that the quality is, 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 is satisfactory. Uh, you need to look at the chemicals as well as the microbial quality and make sure that it's satisfactory. But on a large urban scale, Groundwater has been used uh, as, a, as a supply of drinking water. We have to make sure that uh, the groundwater tables are kept recharged and, 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 and kept sustainable. Uh, in, in the developing world, uh, there's a huge, huge problem with unsustainable use of groundwater. In the developed world, there's, been, there's a huge problem of unsustainable use of groundwater. And so when we use groundwater, we need to make sure that it's, uh, it's used in a sustainable manner. Part of that, too, is that, and exactly correct, is fossil water. If you take too much water out of the ground without the ability of that water to be recharged in appropriate time, it will deplete. You will deplete that resource. And the question about maintaining groundwater quality 
In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency regulates water at the level of the communities, and there's 160,000 plus community or non-community water system regulated. And individual homeowners' groundwater is regulated by the homeowner. And usually, unfortunately, some of the times that you are forced to test your water as an individual home is when you want to sell your house, and the bank says what the quality of your water and is it perked. So there's not that maintaining and the same level and attitude in there. I showed you a slide about the different size of microorganisms. One of the challenges, bacteria can be effectively filtered by groundwater. Viruses, uh, they're smaller. They can slip through even groundwater through torturous paths for hundreds of meters and still be potentially pathogenic. So well-run or well-maintained groundwater is a good supply. I, I agree with you, probably better than surface waters, given the caveats that you need to maintain it and know what's in that water supply and the source of the, the groundwater. Hi, Talisa Loveless, USDA, ARS. I have a question about the wastewater treatment plant. I'd like to know if um, you have any uh, green technology or renewable technology used at your wastewater treatment plant. I know it is very large. You mentioned it's very large. And I wanted to know if you do have such processes in place, how did, how did they come about? Was, how did the mechanism uh, come about to get that green technology in place at your plant? And also I'd like to know if um, there's any talk among the other wastewater treatment plants um, if, if there is anything in place that would say that if a wastewater treatment plant is going to upgrade or do any renovations, should green technology be included as being considered or looked at? Uh, so at, at, at the onset, I, I should say that all wastewater treatment plants are green technology plants. Uh, we produce clean water, and so we, we, we believe that we are green technology uh, plants. But having said that, uh, I think it's important to uh, point, point out that uh, where we see the future of wastewater treatment is, is actually not even call it a waste and call it a resource. And so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole movement within our field the, to call it resource recovery facilities and uh, water resource recovery facilities and that's 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 a a movement and 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 really the reason for that is there's energy in that water in wastewater there's energy in the wastewater and there's nutrients in that wastewater and how do you actually and and there's water itself and so how do we actually get the best of all of those products in the water but at the same time meet our uh, e ecosystem permit requirements. And so uh, if, if you look at uh, the trends and how uh, e even in the region uh, water utilities are going is, is a f the easiest, the first and easiest uh, approach is really get the energy out of the water and, and, re and use that energy. And then the next is, is, is to perhaps get the water itself and you know, use the water in, in different reuse applications. And then the third is to try and get some of the nutrients out of the water and actually uh, and, and, and use that in a beneficial way. Uh, within the context of water utilities, we have always try to use nutrients in a beneficial way, say as uh, through agriculture and, and, and farming of, of, of our, uh, of our uh, biosolids product. Uh, this is basically disinfected product that, that is sent to farms. Uh, where, where we are is actually also creating other value products such as soil amendments and and, and actually um, uh, fertilizer products out of, out of these, uh, 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 you know, the, the resources that are in the wastewater plant itself. And so, so we, are, we are moving in the direction of recovering energy, recovering the water, recovering the nutrients, and, and all of that is uh, happening in, in, in many of the wastewater treatment plants within the region today. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from our audience? Well, I, can no, I, have a last yes, I do have please, a comment, please. and it's back to following up on this, because there's really some exciting dynamics in, in reuse. 
and you know uh, in reuse there is phosphor there is now going to be limited phosphorus available in the world for in, but there's a lot of phosphorus in that that if we could figure out ways to reduce the energy to recover that phosphorus that could be a commodity in there as well and then one of the things our colleagues in the preparedness and security side is on sensors because when we start reusing water and the big push now is direct potable reuse when we say direct potable reuse is coming, that clean water is coming from used clean water. I'm not sure my own terminology here, but we have this idea of water that's been used several times that you would circulate back into a drinking water supply. If you did that in real time without a buffer of a natural buffer or say a, a ground or, or a or reservoir a lake. or a lake, you'd want to be sure to know when things weren't going correct. And you want that to be real time, and you want that to be able to be diverted if there was some challenges in that water. So the sensor technology is advancing very quickly. And one of the ideas behind this is where would you put these sensors in to determine the microbial quality and chemical quality that you could divert it. And the other thing is that we now have smartphone technology almost everywhere. Each individual could be used as part of that monitoring service. You know, it's part of the ideas of being proactive in there. Very good. Okay. So. Well, that's great. That's a great point to stop. I want to first thank our both of our speakers. You're I want to thank our audience, I want to thank our online community, and I'd just like to say that the next Microbes After Hours is actually scheduled for November 19th, and the topic is going to be Ebola. So I hope you can join us. Um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And wash your hands. Wash thank you. <laughs>